So we're going to launch into, as I said, tough questions this week. We're going to do a, a two-part series. I'm going to miss the second half of it, so you guys will be here for it, but I won't. Uh, so two-part opener, uh, Navigating Tough Conversations. Today is going to be part one of Navigating Tough Conversations, and we're going to just talk about staying grounded. How do we avoid the pitfalls and keep from ending up just in a blown-up mess? And then Jamie's going to do part two next week, and he's going to talk about the art of persuasion. You know, how do we, how do we make an argument? Um, we're not opposed to taking a stand, but we want to take a stand well. And how do we make an argument well in a world full of emotional shouting matches? Um, and I think that's really what it is that we live in right now. We live in a world that's just full of emotional shouting matches. A lot of it happens on social media. People post and repost kind of highly emotional articles that they often haven't read. You know, often, often people post and repost things, they haven't read them. They've read the headline and they saw the picture and that was an emotional trigger. And they see the headline and the picture and the emotional trigger happens and, you know, and you like it or you share it um, or you hate it. And you, re, you know, so, but we react emotionally based on these little, like little bite-sized triggers. Um, and I want to take a minute just as the, at the beginning of the message, we're going to look at some images, just emotional images from throughout our year. These are mostly images from, from 2017, and, and they, they bring up feelings, and they bring up sides on issues. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to look at them, and while we're looking at the images, just take a minute to just ask yourself, how does this make me feel? What's my emotional reaction to these images. I find that it can be often really hard to talk about things that are strong emotional triggers for us. And, um, and the, the passage that I want to share from today is from Luke chapter 10. And this is when Jesus is asked a question about whether or not to pay taxes to Caesar or not. Uh, some time ago, I participated in teaching a preaching workshop at a national vineyard conference, and the, what I chose to talk about was actually our Tough Questions series that we do at Coast. And I used this passage as an illustration of how it is that we like to think through tough questions. And so, in some ways, my hope is that this passage, as we look at it, will help us to think about how can I just avoid the traps and have tough conversations well. It also gives you a little bit of a window into how Jamie and I think about this series every year. Um, so I'm going to pray and we'll take a look at the passage. A note is that I'm, I'm getting over the flu and my brain is a little bit sluggish, so I may read off the page uh, more than I usually do on a Sunday morning, so forgive me for that. Uh, let's pray. Lord, uh, just welcome your presence. I want to thank you again just for the incredible miracle of Grace's life. And, um, and Lord, as we just launch into uh, this series just talking about hard conversations, um, would, you, would you meet us? Would you draw our hearts together? Would you help us to know you and would you help us to reflect your love in everything that we do and everything that we say? And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So from Luke chapter 20, Beginning in verse 20. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies, that is the, the Jewish religious leaders of the community at that time, who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. 
So the spies questioned him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right, and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their duplicity and said to them, Show me a denarius, whose image and inscription are on it. Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, Then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he had said there in public, and astonished by his answer, they became silent. So Jesus is being confronted with what is one of the explosive political issues of his day. Um, And the taxes that are referred to here aren't the same taxes that tax collectors would have collected in the, the tax booths that we hear about in other places in the New Testament. This refers to an annual tribute that was one denarius, which is a day's wage per adult male. Um, So the issue with this particular tax is not that it's an incredible financial hardship, but it's it's a tribute tax. It is a symbolic submission to the foreign rulership of the Roman overlords. Um, And the coin would have an inscription referring to the divinity of of the line of Roman emperors. Um, you know, so in some ways, it's not only a, a symbol of Roman rulership, but of the sort of divine right of Roman rulership. And there were riots in Israel when this tax was first started. Um, so what's happening is the Jewish religious leadership is feeling threatened. And they have sent spies who are pretending interest in Jesus' teaching. But their goal is to bait Jesus into saying something that's going to get him into trouble. Um, that's kind of a lot like a modern political debate. You know, when, you know, two years ago when we had the, uh, the election, this happens, right? The, the debate's often sort of set up to bait somebody into saying something that's going to get them into trouble. Um, it, you know, so here's Jesus' position. If he says, yes, we should pay taxes to Caesar, then he's going to lose the respect of the Jewish nationalists and the conservative religious community who's excited that he's bringing something new. The people lose interest and they lose respect. Uh, If he says no, then he can be arrested for sedition by the Roman government. And so he's, the idea is to put him in a no-win situation, see which answer he'll pick, and either one is fine, because either way, the, the hope is that he's ruined in terms of his public influence. Now, for most of us, we don't have anybody in our lives who's actively trying to trick us into saying something they can put us in jail for. Um, but I think that loaded political questions are often still similarly deceptive today because they're characterized by false dichotomies and by a pressure to choose sides. And I think that we can learn a lot from Jesus and from his response. Jesus recognizes right away that this is a trap. And the first thing that he does is avoid the trap. We can learn from Jesus, don't walk into the trap. And how Jesus avoids walking into this trap is he doesn't directly answer the question that's being asked. Now, it's not because he's being avoidant. Jesus isn't saying, you know, I'm not about politics. I'm not going to comment on this subject. He's not avoiding the issue. What he's doing is recognizing that the question itself is deceptive. Um, So a thing we can learn from Jesus about not walking into the trap, don't accept the question as the world frames it. Um, I want to give you a a little bit of a silly illustration for this one. Um, So that's a little bit of a shout out to the the math geeks out there. Um, Has anybody heard of Epimenides' Paradox? Uh, Epimenides was a Cretan philosopher from 600 BC, and... And he's famous for this one saying, uh, all Cretans are liars. And that basically translates to, I'm lying, or what's most understandable from a modern perspective, this statement is false. Now, if you think about this, this statement, okay, this statement is false. Okay, that means this sentence is not true. So if this sentence is not true, then it must not be false. This sentence must be true. Okay, this sentence is true. Okay, if this sentence is true, then this sentence is false. 
If this sentence is false, then it must be true. This is what um, a guy named Douglas Hofstadter likes to call a strange loop. And it's basically just crafted to mess with your head. Um, now, it's a little bit of a silly illustration, but, but the point here is that not all statements can be classified as true or false. Um, and I would say a corollary of that is not every proposition, not every either or proposition should be accepted. When we're offered an either or, we shouldn't always choose one or the other of the two possible answers. Um, here's, a, here's something a little bit more loaded than Epimenides' paradox. Which of these statements is true? Black lives matter. Blue lives matter. All lives matter. I don't think any one of us would want to stand up and say, I disagree with one of these statements. One of these statements is actually incorrect. But they're emotionally loaded statements, aren't they? Because they mean a lot more than what they say. It's not just what they say. You wouldn't know from the surface. I remember the first time that I saw all lives matter, I was like, yeah, that's cool. Oh, wait, that's meant to negate the first statement. And I don't know how I should respond to that. Explosive political questions are generally designed to get us to choose sides and to identify as in-group or out-group. You can think about Republicans and Democrats this way. Sometimes, now I think there are years when Republicans and Democrats, Democrats really disagree with each other. There have been many years in the past when, when it's been hard to tell the difference. Um, and it can almost be like your political party is just sort of like your sports team. Like people have an emotional attachment to the thing that they have heard was right their entire lives, but they don't necessarily always know why they feel so emotional about what they do. And what happens is we just kind of stick each other into boxes and then we all know how to feel about each other and we turn off our minds and the fight can start. Um, I remember uh, a close family member of mine during the, during the last election, so in the previous year, uh, sent me uh, an article via email about a politician's wife who I will not name, who had uh, you know, posed nude for some publication. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness. You know, this goes completely against the values of the person who sent it to me. I know this person. And this goes against every value that she has. If this had been a Democratic candidate's wife, what I know would have been said was this is completely inappropriate. This does not belong in our political conversation. This is irrelevant. We should not be bringing this kind of thing into it. But because it was a Republican candidate's wife, all of a sudden the values are actually forgotten. The values are forgotten and it's just, it's one more piece of fuel for the fire and it goes into the email before anybody even has a chance to think about it. Um, and when we get caught up, we don't recognize our values anymore. Now I'm not saying that all sides are equal. And I want, I want that to be clear. I'm not saying that all sides are, not, are equally righteous, and I'm not saying that we should not take a stand. What I am saying is that once we are able to put each other into boxes, then we all know how we're supposed to feel about each other, and then we turn off our brains and we start fighting. Um, so don't let anyone put you in a box. Um, so don't choose sides from the world's teams. Because once we do that, we're in a box and the brains go off. Um, don't choose from the world's teams. I think a really great example of this from the Old Testament, um, from Joshua chapter 5. Joshua's preparing for battle. Um, and there's this, there's this incredible moment where, where an angel appears to him. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? 
Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Josh fell down on his face in reverence. Neither side. God does not seem to feel in any way obligated to choose sides on human teams. You know, we make up teams, and God does not seem to feel obligated to choose a team. And so if God doesn't feel obligated to choose a team, neither should we. Um, now, once again, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't be political. Um, I think that faith is ultimately political in, in, in to all kinds of inescapable ways. But we should be political on our own terms, not on someone else's terms. It's going back to the passage... Um, Jesus gives this really interesting answer. He, shows, he says, show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription are on it? Caesar's. And he says to them, then give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. What is Jesus doing here? Um, he's identifying uh, the heart issue. So another thing we can learn from Jesus, identify the heart issue. Uh, in this case, the whole question in the beginning is false because people are really trying to put Jesus into a box and take him down one way or another. But the question is not entirely unfounded because they're still asking about a question that people in the community care about. People actually still care about this question. And so even if the person who's asking it isn't interested, the crowd that's listening is interested. But they're not interested in the question the way that it's been worded. The way that it's been worded is a false question. You know, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And the reason why it's a false question is because everyone does. They're all already paying this tax. They're not trying to decide whether or not to pay the tax. They don't have a choice as to whether or not they're going to pay the tax. Everyone already does pay the tax. Um, and so, and so, you know, is it right or not, is not the right question. But the heart question, what's going on inside people, why this is a big explosive issue, is to what extent is my ethnic and religious identity compromised by submitting to the Roman government, by paying this, this tribute tax? Am I, am I compromised as a person? How do I think about myself and my life when I'm paying this tax? Um, and a note just on how the political questions of our day are really similar. Um, explosive issues are often framed impersonally and moralistically. It's not specifically about me. It is a black and white, right or wrong, about a broad issue without a specific application. Um, and underneath that are personal issues that are often very deeply connected to identity. Um, here's an example. A lot of people in the U.S. right now are very preoccupied with the question of whether or not ball players should kneel during the national anthem. And I would say in a lot of very similar ways, this is a false question. Unless you are a ball player, in which case the question might be, should I kneel? If you are not a ball player, then the question, should other people be doing this, is not super relevant. The reality is that they are. And the question then becomes, you know, how should I respond? How should I feel about what's going on? Um, and I think that that's what's really going on. And that's why this has been very controversial, because people are asking the question, what does this mean for me? Um, and it's very personal, and it's related to all kinds of other questions, the other the other statements that we put up earlier, and people feel upset when they somehow or other feel like it's about them. When people are feeling upset that this is going on, something inside feels like this is about me. And a really important question is why? Why do people feel like it's about them? And how should we respond? And um, I would love to just tackle that question right now, but I'm actually just gonna leave it hanging. Um, <laughs> We don't have time today, but there will be more conversations about race in America uh, coming up soon. Um, but that's where we would go. If we were going to take that as a tough question this week, that's, how, that's where we would be going with it. Um, 
Now, what Jesus does here is fascinating because the real question is about identity. Jesus responds talking about identity. He says, well, show me this denarius. Whose image is on it? Well, it's Caesar's image, okay? Well, if it's got Caesar's image on it, it's got Caesar's little inscription on it, you know, if Caesar wants to claim that a little piece of metal belongs to him because he put his image on it and he put a little inscription on it, then, you know, sure, he can have that. But what is it that has God's image and God's inscription on it? What is it that has God's image on it? Give to God what is God's. And so he responds about the image of God. He responds with the message that human beings are created in God's image and that that is the part that's actually way more important than any other piece of this whole puzzle. So Jesus is often misunderstood here as talking about establishing the realm of authority of the state. As a matter of fact, you'll read a lot of commentators who will say what Jesus is doing is establishing a separate realm of authority. This is the authority of the state, and this is the authority of the church or of God. Um, that would be an incredibly unlike Jesus thing to do. Uh, that's not what Jesus is doing here at all. One thing you'll notice is that Jesus actually never claims that anything whatsoever belongs to Caesar. If something happens to belong to Caesar, then give Caesar whatever is due to him. Um, when Jesus does that, he's actually making Caesar completely irrelevant, just like he would make any other false god irrelevant. If Caesar wants to set him up, himself up as divine and put his image on things that are dead and claim that they belong to him, then he can have it. But Caesar doesn't own you. What is alive, what is created by God, what is created in God's image can never be taken away from you. And no matter what he makes you pay, that can never, ever change. That's the message that Jesus is bringing. Paying tribute doesn't mean that Caesar owns you. And so how will you honor God with your life if God is the Lord of your life? So Jesus is responding with a true message about identity. And I want to just end by saying that we also ought to respond out of our identity in Christ. So respond out of your identity in Christ. A few little pieces of this, this that I want to highlight. One is remember who you are, which is children of God made in his image. You know, I know for me, when, gosh, back when the present election happened, I remember there was the, the video that went out, uh, the, Trump's comments about how you can grab him by the, the, the private parts, and you can get away with that if you're important and all of that. It was, I remember it was really deeply personal for me, because as a person who'd been a victim of sexual harassment, you know, that, that exact thing that he was saying, I, I grew up with people who thought that that was an okay thing to do, and I remember what it felt like. And there was something, when I was triggered, you know, I saw that and I was triggered in my heart, right? And I react, like, what is this saying about me when the leaders of our country say these kinds of things? And for me, I'm always triggered. It doesn't actually matter if it's that issue. If anyone is being dehumanized, it triggers the same thing. So whether it's a disabled person or whether it's a, a, a racial or ethnic group or whether it's a nationality or another religious group, whenever someone is being dehumanized, it hits that trigger in me. And I, and I can feel it just in my, in my gut. Um, but something that we know from being made in God's image, when, you, um, when, when, we're, when people say and do dehumanizing things, what does that say about us? Well, not much really, does it? Does a human being have the, the authority to take away our humanity? See, when you let your identity feel threatened, you've lost control. And as soon as you've lost control, you've lost the argument. And remembering that we're made in God's image is remembering that, that no one can touch this. Caesar doesn't own you. No one owns you. No one can touch this. This is made in the image of God. 
And then we can turn that around, not just I'm triggered and I'm angry and I'm upset, but hey, this touches on a core value for me. Human dignity is important to me. Human beings made in God's image is important to me. I'm going to stand for that. Um, so remember who you are, that you're children of God. Um, remember your mission, that we're messengers of love. You know, we're saying a lot of people right now are asking themselves the question, you know, should ball players kneel during the anthem? Um, a number of people are asking themselves, should I, should I boycott sporting events because ball players are kneeling during the anthem? Um, a, a question about that. A big question about that. What, what's the message that's being sent there? You know, these are very complicated issues. The issues that are involved are, are, are very complicated. And there, and there are, are many sides to many conversations, and you might have really good reasons for what you think, and it might be a great conversation to have. But I don't think that we ever want to align ourselves against people who are concerned for the well-being of their friends and their family and people in their community. You know, think about what message is being sent by behaviors. I think another great example of this is uh, events in Charlottesville. You know, on the surface, it was a demonstration about the removal of historical monuments. Underneath that, it was a demonstration about hate. And underneath that, it's a demonstration about fear. And when you think about, well, how would I respond to something like that? I think, how would I, as a child of God, as a messenger of the love of God in this world, want to respond to that? Not with another message of hate. Not with a message, I hate the haters. <laughs> Not with a message of fear. What does it look like for Christians to respond with a message of love? Um, and lastly... Remember your destiny, that this is not the end. Um, you know, we're not going to set all things right in this world at this time. But this is not the end. Caesar's tax is temporary. It has to do with money. It has to do with dead objects. And Caesar is not your master, and money is not your master. In the same way for us, whatever happens today, now, that might make us feel bad is not the end but we're looking forward to a reckoning. It's not going to matter nearly so much whether or not we found that we were treated fairly as it will matter how we loved during this season in this life. Um, now the, the people after Jesus gave this answer went away, went away amazed because they'd heard something that was entirely different from what they were hearing from the rest of the world around them. And my prayer for us is that we would be like that that we wouldn't just align ourselves with the side that seems most in the right and join the shouting match, but that we would give an answer that reflects the love of God and the wisdom of God in a way that's entirely different from the rest of the world around us and would, would get people's attention and get people to stop shouting at one another and get people to start listening to one another and learning and respecting and valuing one another. Um, and so I just want to pray that over us. So if you guys could stand with me, I'm going to just pray just a prayer over us that, that the Lord will give us wisdom for all of these things. Well, Holy Spirit, would you come? God, thank you that you created us in your image. Lord, thank you that there's, there's nothing in the world that can take that away. And God asks that you would help us, that we, wouldn't just, that we wouldn't simply react out of being triggered by the explosive issues in the world around us, Lord, but that, that we would avoid those traps, that we would not be put into boxes. And instead, Lord, that we would just insist on being reflections of your love in everything that we do. You should teach us to give answers like Jesus. And pray these things in Jesus' name. 
Amen. So we're going to do a closing song as we do each week, and after that there will be an opportunity to receive prayer. So at the end of each one of our services, there's a time to receive prayer. And in a lot of ways, the message today was very kind of mental, so it's things to, to, to think about. Um, but there are a couple of things related to the message that I just wanted to call out that I think we might want to pray for some people for. One is, you know, if anything that's going on in the world around us right now is making you feel dehumanized, you know, and that's a and that's a deep trigger for you. You feel like, gosh, my my humanity is just being is being called into question. I feel I feel violated and stepped on and and it hurts and I don't know how to deal with that right now. If that's you, I would love to just pray that God will give you that that dignity, knowing that Caesar doesn't own you. That knowing what our identity is in Christ. Um, I, Another group is, I mean, I know there, we're going to talk a lot about all of these issues. We're going to talk a lot about issues related to race. But if you're in a relationship right now with maybe a close a co-worker or a family member or somebody where it just seems like, you know, you just don't know how to talk to them because everything is just explosive and there doesn't seem to be any way to engage without just blowing up. Um, but also specifically love to pray for you that God will that God will show you a way through and give you a way to to respond. So if you're in either one of those groups, particularly would love to pray for you. And as with every single week, we would love to pray for you for any issues that, at all that you've come in with. If you've come in and you're and you're sick or you're injured or you're lonely or you're struggling, whatever it is, we always love to pray for anyone uh, at any time on any Sunday. So I'm gonna bring our service to a, a close and then you can come on up if you would like to receive prayer. We close the service by holding hands across the aisle. So if you can take the hands of people who are standing near you, it's a, a symbol of unity. Uh, each week we stand together and hold hands because it's a symbol that God has made us one with one another, that he's called us to listen to one another and learn from one another and understand each other and be gracious and good to one another. And so God, just as we go from here, would you cause us to live in unity? Would you fill us with your presence and with your love and with your grace? And would you pour out your goodness on us as we go? And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So God bless you guys. Come on up if you'd like to receive prayer. And uh, did you have a word? Oh, okay. <laughs> Hey, as it's uh, Michelle's last Sunday before sabbatical, we also want to just have a time to bless her. So if uh, you want to pray for Michelle, she's going to be up here. And uh, we just want to pray for her for her time on sabbatical. So 